Thanks, Dave, for the uh, introduction, and thanks to the uh, Allen Institute for the opportunity to speak. I'll be talking about uh, MR-guided focused ultrasound. Uh, only disclosure is the uh, research funding from the FUS Foundation. We're going to go through some uh, technological overview, brief history, current applications, and then some of the future uh, applications. Uh, this is my mentor, Dr. Cassell. He's the chair of the Focused Ultrasound Foundation, and he talks about his eureka moment when he realized that focused energy could be used deeper than the brain to treat a range of uh, diseases he's been struggling with throughout his career. Then he had the realization that he wasn't the first to come up with this idea, uh, and the concept of focused energy uh, has been around uh, since the dawn of time. So what we're looking at is the marriage of two technologies. Uh, we're looking at uh, focused ultrasound therapy, which is able to treat tissues deep within uh, the brain. In this case, it's non-invasive, it's accurate and precise. And then using uh, high fidelity imaging, particularly with uh, MRI guidance in the brain, but also ultrasound, uh, to coordinate those two technologies to treat lesions deep within the brain. Of course, it was the Fry brothers in the 1950s who came up with the original prototype, uh, the so-called uh, uh, monster, which was this four-pronged uh, ultrasonic transducer that was uh, two stories in height. Uh, and that was the first device that was used to create lesions in the brain in the 1950s. And it was Lasley Excel uh, that went on to try and develop a prototype uh, to use ultrasound to treat lesions deep within the brain. The problem was he couldn't see where he was going because the imaging uh, modalities at the time were pneumoencephalogram and, and other uh, pretty poor technologies. CT hadn't really come out yet. Um, and he couldn't get through the skull, so he had to do a craniectomy. So it was really, in 1967, Lexell went on to change uh, tact and went for ionizing radiation. Uh, that way he was able to get through the skull uh, and the same principle, intersecting beams of light, of, uh, of radiation. People didn't give up. They still looked at using hyperthermia to treat lesions within the brain using ultrasound. But as you can see from uh, this grainy picture, it's pretty hard to tell what you're going after. Um, and so that was abandoned. And so we've really come full circle. We had this intention of using image-guided interventions. Uh, FUST was abandoned because of the skull, and we couldn't see what we were doing. And now we've got three Tesla MRI, and we've got these great transducers that can get us deep within the brain. The key step was this uh, CT correction algorithm that we have uh, for the skull. The skull is very irregular, um, even uh, feeling your own head. You know there's some irregularities. And the inside, the inner table of the skull is uh, quite irregular. And so it was a CT correction that we used, which basically brings all of the uh, ultrasonic beams into phase so that when they get through uh, the skull, they can make a, uh, a high energy point. And what we do at that point is we can create necrosis. And the key thing here is if we can get a piece of the brain to 57 degrees for one second, it's cooked. It's kind of like frying an egg. Once that tissue is uh, denatured, it, it doesn't come back, whether it's a tumor or uh, a normal piece of the brain that we're trying to interrupt a neuronal circuit. We've got very sharp margins compared to radiosurgery. So with, with radiation treatment, which is very tight, um, with the focused ultrasound, it's, the cutoff is extremely tight. So we go from uh, lesion tissue to no lesion without any kind of decay that we tend to get uh, with uh, radiation treatment. So there's a range of potential advantages. We can uh, treat the same lesion multiple times. There's no cumulative dose effect that we get with uh, radiation treatment. Uh, and we don't get secondary tumors from, uh, from radiation, uh, which is what we, we see even with uh, stereotactic radiosurgery. There's a range of indications that I'll talk about uh, some of these, but to summarize, brain tumors, uh, stroke, we've been looking at intracerebral hemorrhage in particular, and it's really the functional category here, uh, which has been the first category to take off, and then there's some more kind of out there ideas uh, over here, which we'll talk about. So the current state of clinical applications, in 2010, Drs. Uh, uh, Martin and John Minode published the first uh, human trial uh, where they treated patients with uh, chronic pain. And what they did there is they used uh, this device uh, here. It's a, a hemispheric array uh, with over 1,000 ultrasonic uh, transducers. The patient's head is placed inside. There's a water bath of degassed water to allow the uh, ultrasonic energy to transverse uh, or traverse through the skull to the brain, and they're able to create these lesions uh, in the thalamus here. And we can see uh, from their study they had 12 patients that were effectively treated for uh, 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 neurogenic pain that was uh, recalcitrant to uh, medical therapy. 
uh, and it was an ambulatory procedure, and you can see the lesions uh, on the MR. And really, that was the genesis of the uh, FDA pilot trial that I was involved in with Dr. Elias uh, at UVA. And here's a picture, again, of the transducer. There's 1,024 uh, ultrasonic transducers behind uh, this helmet. And the patient's head goes in here. They're in a stereotactic frame. Uh, in this cavity here, there's water circulating behind here to allow the ultrasound to travel uh, and also to cool down the patient's scalp because it gets uh, warm from uh, the sonication. This was published in the New England uh, Journal, and this is uh, one of the very first patients. You can see he's trying to uh, do a simulated eating task where he's trying to lift these beans uh, from one pot to the other. You can imagine going to a fancy restaurant, your favorite glass of red wine. It's an extremely debilitating okay. disease. Oh. And this is him three months after the procedure. Um, you can see he's able to uh, easily uh, complete this simulated eating task. And this is a huge quality of life improvement uh, for these patients. <laughs> so what we saw, this is the, uh, these are the lesions that we create in the thalamus and the VI nucleus of the thalamus. And it changes over time. Uh, and that's been uh, published, how these uh, lesions kind of change with imaging studies. There's a little bit of swelling at the seventh day, uh, and then that slowly disappears over time. And this is what we get the patients to do intraoperatively. So they're actually sitting in the MRI with prism glasses, and they're drawing um, these spirals. And as we sonicate, we create a bigger and bigger lesion until the patient is able to write, write in a straight line and do these spirals. And that way we know we're in exactly the right spot of the VIM thalamus. Uh, and that we're going to get a treatment effect that is uh, going to be long-lasting. And sometimes if we're a little bit off based on Morales Atlas, that's where we, we think we need to go. Uh, but sometimes we can be a little bit off and the patient might experience some sensory abnormality in the face or the arm. We know we need to move our target. So rather than the gamma knife where we zap it based on anatomical landmarks, with focused ultrasound we can actually interoperatively test the circuitry of the brain. And what we saw at one year um, is, and the key thing here is the uh, disability score. If we look at the disability score at baseline and then we follow them out to one year, uh, this is extremely uh, uh, gratifying quality of life change for these patients. So in terms of uh, clinical trials going on at Swedish, uh, Dr. Gwynn's just uh, finished up the essential tremor uh, pivotal study with the FDA and those results should be coming out fairly shortly. Uh, but again, uh, the results were very positive. Um, tremor dominant Parkinson's disease, Parkinson's disease is another application that's currently being investigated. I'll talk about brain metastases. Targeted drug delivery, the idea of uh, circulating uh, micro bubbles or drugs packaged uh, in the micro bubbles, and then we can use a very low frequency of the, or a low uh, energy of the ultrasound to break up those bubbles at target tissues. Gliomas, uh, pain I mentioned, epilepsy I'll talk about, an intracerebral hemorrhage, and some other uh, interesting applications. With brain tumors, uh, originally they had to do a craniectomy, um, and then there's some early work done for glioblastoma. Uh, we were the first to treat a metastatic uh, brain tumor here at Swedish. Um, this lesion here was a recurrent metastatic lesion, and we were able to successfully target that region uh, and get uh, DWI changes post-op day one uh, to show that we were able to lesion that area. It's um, only an experience of one patient. However, it's uh, encouraging that we should at least continue to look at this as a treatment modality for metastatic tumors. Potential applications, some of these are kind of out there. Um, we published this in the journal that made the cover. Um, the theoretical treatment envelope depends on which frequency of transducer you use. The lower frequency we can get to further out, closer to the surface of the skull, the higher frequency transducer, uh, the beams of ultrasound are not able to bend in time, but, and so we can only use the kind of core structures of the brain here. Um, with the failings of the ROSE trial for the treatment of temporal lobe epilepsy with a gamma knife, we were very interested in uh, treating patients with temporal lobe epilepsy uh, with MR-guided focused ultrasound. Uh, and so we've uh, been doing that in the lab. There's other uh, areas uh, such as tuberous sclerosis or hypothalamic hematoma, which are other causes of uh, of epilepsy, which are also kind of easy targets for us, particularly here right in the center of the brain. Uh, that's easy target. This was, was a kind of a harder one. And so what we did is we developed a, a cadaveric model to test the uh, treatment envelope and test to see if we could get a temperature rise in the, in the uh, hippocampus. And then we basically performed a virtual temporal lobectomy uh, using the device. 
and we were able to uh, create an area of the temporal lobe at surgery. This is the area that we remove, and we were able to do that um, uh, with the cadaveric model, which is highly suggestive uh, based on our data that we had for the uh, essential tremor studies uh, before we did them in real humans, uh, that we're going to be able to do this uh, in, in real patients. And that was published in the journal. CSF diversion, sometimes the spinal fluid spaces can get kind of messed up, and you can see here the ventricles are pushed over by this large cyst, uh, similarly here. And so what we thought is, well, what if you burst a hole in here using cavitation and the focused ultrasound, then you wouldn't have to do a surgery where you go in and poke a hole in it. And so what we did is we created a, we did a septum pellucidotomy using focused ultrasound, and if we change the parameters of the ultrasound, we can actually get a controlled uh, cavitation effect and basically bust a hole in the tissue uh, rather than cooking it. Similarly with aqueductal stenosis, when there's a narrowing in the aqueduct, at, at surgery we basically put a tube in and poke a hole in the bottom of the uh, third ventricle. Uh, and so the plan was to do this using uh, focused ultrasound and again we were able to successfully create a lesion uh, in the floor of the third ventricle uh, which would uh, mitigate the reason or the need to do surgery. Trigeminal neuralgia is another application. This is the trigeminal nerve here. At surgery, what we find is uh, typically the superior cerebellar artery, but there's an artery just here you can see on the MR is beating away and impinging on the nerve, and that's what causes the pain. Uh, and at surgery, we put a little piece of felt underneath that uh, artery to stop it, uh, beating away on the nerve. But one of the other ways we can treat it, of course, is with gamma knife, where we uh, zap the nerve with radiation just as it enters the root entry zone uh, to uh, denervate the nerve. Uh, and so we looked at whether we could do that with HIFU and again avoid the, uh, the radiation. What we found is when we did it, we had to be careful because the petrous bone, which is right in, in the area of the target, there's a shadow of energy that hits the petrous bone and bone is uh, really good at absorbing heat. And so what we have to do is we have to turn off a lot of the elements. This is the, each one of these represents one of the elements in the focused ultrasound transducer. And what we have to do is turn a lot of them off so that the shadow of the energy doesn't hit the petrous bone because we don't want to cook the facial nerve and uh, the acoustic nerve. Uh, there's no point in taking someone's, hearing, uh, taking someone's facial pain away if they can't hear you afterwards and they can't move their face. And so with the, uh, with the blocking, we could really mitigate that, uh, that temperature rise we were seeing in the petrous bone. So again, from a safety standpoint, we think this would be feasible. Looking at uh, uh, psychosurgery or doing surgery for psychiatric disease, uh, we were able to perform a cingulotomy, um, which has been used with uh, radiosurgery with uh, some success. Uh, so that's another potential application. Uh, Dr. Chang in uh, South Korea has done several patients now using the anterior uh, limb of the internal capsule for uh, treatment-resistant depression, uh, as well as obsessive compulsive disorder with good effect. Um, so that's kind of a new, a new thing. It's going to be very hard for us to do that trial in the United States. Um, just with uh, the history of previous uh, surgeries for psychiatric disease, but they're getting good progress in South Korea. In terms of uh, stroke, we were particularly interested in uh, intracerebral hemorrhage uh, because there was a serendipitous discovery where um, with large clots we could liquefy them using cavitation. And so we developed this cadaveric model of intracerebral hemorrhage, um, which is kind of harder to do than you think because we have to get this intracerebral hemorrhage into the brain without introducing any air. As soon as we introduce any air into the head, uh, we can't do the experiment. This is the transducer here. Again, the patient would be in the, uh, in the uh, transducer here with a, a water bath around their head. We put an intracerebral hemorrhage into the ventricle in this case, and you can see this little blue target here. That's the one shot that we took. And with one shot, you can see that we basically blasted a hole in the clot uh, right here. Uh, compared to the pre-op. So you can get these very well-defined uh, uh, cavitatory responses. So the idea is that the patient comes into the hospital with intracerebral hemorrhage. We put them in the uh, uh, MRI scanner. We liquefy the clot. And while we're there, once it's liquefied, we can drill a little twist drill, hand drill, um, into the patient's skull and aspirate the clot out um, <clears throat> while, we're, uh, while we're watching for um, progress, i.e. we're watching to make sure we've got all the clot out. So this is the uh, pre and post. When we uh, take this intracerebral hemorrhage and we can liquefy it, it, it turns white on T2 uh, on the MR. And again, you can see it kind of changes color. That way we know we've actually liquefied it. Uh, and again here, it's liquefied. And then we just take this 
uh, small stylet here, and we can just basically do a little twist drill through the patient's skull, uh, and we can aspirate this, uh, and it comes out kind of just like water um, and with minimal residual. So in conclusion, just to finish up, um, MR-guided-focused ultrasound, it's a rapidly evolving field. Um, really, in the last 10 years, since we've got um, great MRI technology associated with these changes in uh, transducer technology, we've really been able to uh, kind of uh, change where we go with it. Uh, we've been able to uh, treat a lot of functional uh, conditions with Parkinson's disease, essential tremor, uh, and uh, soon to be uh, uh, more, more commonly used for brain tumors, blood-brain barrier opening, uh, and also possibly for uh, psychiatric disease. Uh, so there's a range of research opportunities and um, it's really kind of moving forward and we're lucky at Swedish to have one of the uh, few uh, transducers in the country. I think uh, I'll take any questions. Thanks, uh, Steve. And as Steve mentioned, I think the, um, the prospective randomized uh, trial of 72, I think 73 yeah. patients, which was a multi-center trial, has been completed, one year follow-up. It's in for a publication at the New England Journal and the um, FDA approval is uh, in for review and uh, possibly as early as this fall would be the first application that the technology would be FDA approved for. Yeah, question. Uh, first question was uh, in the context of hemorrhagic stroke, you were able to liquefy the, where the, the blood was. Can you cauterize vessels to stop persistent bleeds? And you, what kind of resolution can you achieve with uh, the focused ultrasound? Uh, the resolution is uh, sub-millimeter accuracy. Uh, typically what we find at surgery is um, the blood vessels stop bleeding, otherwise the patient will be dead. So what we want to do at surgery, we know that we don't have to remove 100% of the clot. So what we typically do, these are usually, intracerebral hemorrhages in the thalamus or putamen have usually started from one of the lenticulostriate branches. So often we don't actually want to remove that piece of clot. So if we get out 70% of the clot clinically, that'll have the same effect as getting out 100%. So we don't really want to cauterize those vessels, we just want to stay away from them. So what we would typically do in this paradigm is, is liquefy all the blood clot that's away from the feeding vessel uh, and, and aspirate that and just leave a little bit behind. Yes, question in the back. Hi, uh, absolutely fantastic talk. Uh, obvious, you've been able to do some pretty spectacular things with uh, permanent structural lesions, but I'm wondering whether you can speculate about being able to cause uh, reversible inhibition, for instance, with focused ultrasound, uh, because that seems like it could be an incredibly powerful research tool. Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. As I mentioned, with the um, pilot study in essential tremor, we did have a few patients, you know, we did the, we did the targeting based off anatomical measurements and they might have got some uh, sensation in the face or in the leg because we were a little bit too lateral. Um, and so the ability to potentially map out the thalamus using this technology is uh, quite unbelievable because all of these lesions, if we don't increase the temperature to the high 50, 60 degrees, everything just goes away. So if we increase it to 42 degrees, 43 degrees, they'll feel something, uh, but it's non-permanent. Um, of course, it would be pretty hard to get volunteers for that study. Um, but uh, yeah, the potential is there. And, and interestingly, for uh, psychiatric disease, um, you know, we, we don't like to lesion the brain unless we have to. But in the context of psychiatric disease, um, you know, we don't know if we stimulated, uh, say, the anterior limb of the internal capsule, uh, but we didn't lesion it, what is that going to do for these patients? Um, they may need to come back every three months for a treatment, but they might feel better. Uh, one of the other things I might point out is <clears throat> when you make a temporary lesion in the brain, you can get a quick MRI scan, and it will show increased water content temporarily where that, that ultrasound is concentrated. So the reversible lesion will light up on the MRI to show you exactly anatomically where you are. Yes. Yeah. 
a, a, yeah, a sub or or sublesional temperature, we don't, we don't know really what's going on. Um, because part of it could be the mechanical agitation and part of it could be heat um, or, or a combination of both. But uh, we don't know when we do these sublesional uh, uh, temperatures exactly what's happening. Um, we just can see the clinical effect. Yes. So, so what? Um, so uh, the just to uh, one comment. I, th I think the uh, the high food or FUS cause the coagulation necrosis of the tissue. So this is temperature and also mechanical. Mechanical is a secondary to uh, the cavitation effect. Mm -hmm. And the, the other is the questions uh, for you. It's an MR guided uh, FUS and compare with the ultrasound guided uh, FUS. I think, I think in some other countries, they've used a similar technology to treat uh, something like liver tumors and pancreatic tumors yep. or uterine fiber. Yeah, that's uh, right. The, the original um, FDA uh, approved uh, application in the US was uh, for uterine fibroids, but it's been um, well described and well proven for um, prostate as well as uterine fibroids. Um, and also now uh, liver and pancreas uh, have been used. And for those modalities, ultrasound is uh, is probably better because it's kind of easier. Um, uh, but for us, um, with the high resolution that's required in the brain where sub-millimeter accuracy is critical, um, we, we're limited with the brain uh, to use uh, MRI. Uh, just one other point on that question. I, I know some people in the audience may not know, but it uh, turns out Seattle is probably the major cluster in the world of medical ultrasound companies because of the sonar research that went on with the sub base and the military and so forth. There's a company called Kona Medical over on the east side, um, which is uh, conducting a worldwide trial now for, for hypertension. And they're doing exactly what you said. Instead of the, what they're trying to do is burn the uh, peri uh, arterial nerves around the renal arteries. And they're locating those by laying the patient down on an ultrasound table, locating the arterial signal, and then targeting the adventitia of the artery where the perirenal nerves reside. And by stripping that of the nerves, you can lower hypertension. That's been shown experimentally for a long time. So it's possible that this could be a, a global, easy treatment for hypertension if it works. But that's in, currently in phase three trials right now. OK, it looks like that's it. Um, so I've got an, a few things I need to do. First of all, um, let's have a quick round of applause for the speakers in this session.